Okay, so, all right guys, welcome to this lecture. We are going to talk about, this is going to be the next subject, so we are going to generalize the autoregressive conditional heterodox classicity. Let me just, uh, okay, see whether this is working, but it seems to. All right, so we are, or have been, seeing what an arch Q process is. I'm not going to um, elaborate on that much longer because we have already had that last week. So what I wanted to do is a generalization. So we have a stochastic process which is called autoregressive conditional heteroscopy. This is a process is the acronym for, this is a, basically the uh, acronym for arch. If the process can be written like this, so you have basically a volatility process times the noise. Now this time, since basically you have the variance, which is a new one, the noise has going to, uh, is going to have the variance one, so it's going to be an IID noise. And then we are going to have a stochastic process, which is called the volatility process, where it's given in its squares, and this is basically an autoregressive process of the squares of the process itself. So as you see, the, uh, the process would depend on its previous realizations, but only with respect to the variance of the process, which you'll see. All right, so this is, I mean, we were discussing some properties of that, which I'm going to recall. Now, one major issue is that this parameter needs to be greater than zero strictly, and the other ones are just non-negative. That was basically the process. Now, if you want to try to generalize that, which is the going to be, it's called, I mean, it's called the generalized version, and this is the um, generalized arch or gauge process, you can say, then you simply just add the, I mean, this is going to be F or the P and Q, you simply just add an autoregressive part of the variance itself. Okay, so there is going to be P, a beta one, which is an additional parameter times the past observation of the conditional variance. Keep in mind, guys, that as we have seen last time, sigma t squared was the conditional variance of the process. So given its past, we have seen this before. And then you have also the past direct impact of the past for the current observation here. And that is going to be its generalization. These parameters are also non-negative as well. So therefore, this is what you're going to have. And uh, that's about it. So as you see, there is not much, as you will see, added to it. And then we're going to discuss some basic properties. Now, these are similar of any stochastic volatility process, but I'm not going to just focus on that. We have seen, for example, that the conditional expectation of the arch process is going to be zero, so it's going to be a generalized version itself. The unconditional one is also zero. Then you have the unconditional variance, which is the expectation of the square of the volatility process. We have seen that before. And then we have also seen that the process is not autocorrelated, interestingly. All right, you got a question. Uh, yeah. yes. uh, when I recall correctly, in the ARMA process, um, there will be average component yes. part of the epsilon, right? Yes. But here it is um, the of the squares. Sigma, right? Yes. Could you give us an intuition? Yes, I will do that. So I will introduce the, the, basically the intuition as well. So as you might see, I mean, the issue would be that if this, I mean, if the process fo follows an arch process, this implies basically an autoregressive process of the squares. That was it, you know. And the intuition will be for that one, if the process follows a generalized version, then its squares would follow the ARMA process. That's the intuition. Okay, so just as the armor generalized basically the AR type of processes, the Garch model would also generalize the Arch model exactly the same way. I'm going to show you that later on. Okay, so that is, of course, the... I mean, we have seen that one last week, so we are going to just, you know, see the new version. But it has the same properties as the old one. Keep in mind that there is no autocollision which is quite a surprising, although it's depending on its past, but not with respect to its current observation, but there is going to be dependency. So there is going to be serial dependency per, basically for the process, and that's something that you would need to see later on. Okay, no autocorrelation, but serial dependency. That is a very famous example for that. Now, we have seen before that the process is stationary because if and only if, of course, 
the unconditional variance does not depend on time. So that is the only issue you might be focusing on because the expectation does not depend on time and neither does the outer correlation. So if stationarity fails, it is due to the variance, of course, right? That's, that's for sure. So the process is going to be stationary if and only if its variance is time independent as you basically might guess. All right, so that, that expression basically is the only expression that you need to focus on when it comes to stationarity. And we're going to look at that one as well. Okay, so, and that's just the same property for the Garch type process as well. So there is nothing that changes for that as the arch is basically, you know, surely uncorrelated expectation zero and the conditional expectation, which is going to be zero. So as the Garch process, not much changes and the, and the unconditional variance is the same expression. So there is no changes regarding that. Now, what about basically the conditional variance as we've seen the conditional variances? This expression is sigma squared, which is basically the square of the volatility process. That is the same, basically the property as for the arch process, nothing. And that is going to be also the, the issue for the Gauge type of processes. So this is called conditional heteroscedasticity because the volatility process is, or the variance process, let's call it that way, the conditional variance is depending on time in that regard. So heteroscedasticity means that the variance depends on time, all right? And homoscedasticity means that it does not in a certain way. Not just that, but it's going to be also stochastic. So in this case, there is a stochastic conditional variance, which it is here. This is a process, all right? So that's something that you need to understand here. Whether the process is stationary or not, its conditional variance is time dependent, all right? That might be sounds, sounding counterintuitive, but keep in mind that for stationarity, um, we don't need to have the conditional variance to be time independent. It's enough basically for the unconditional variance to be time independent, and that is, sometimes the case under certain circumstance. Now, what, what, what's going to be the certain circumstances? I'm going to show you later on, but that's not what I'm talking about. The, uncon the condition of variance is always going to be time dependent, no matter what, even the process is stationary, right? Under circumstances. Now, the generalized version is going to be the same, except for the fact that the volatility process is specified differently, okay? But apart from that, there is not much changes, actually. So this is just basically added by its definition, nothing else, okay? And that is also true for the gauge process. So even only if, basically, I mean, if the process is stationary, the conditional variance is going to be time dependent all the time, okay? We have seen this last week, but there is the new generalization in which I'm going to add to it, so not much big of a deal, actually, <laughs> right? Anyways, okay, so that's what you'll have now regarding the stationarity of the arch process. You'll find, I mean, that is going to be the same issue. I mean, we're, let's recall what the stationarity for the arch process or stationarity condition was. The process is stationary if and only if the sum of these parameters, okay, alpha one, starting by alpha one, is less than one. We have seen this last week. And let me just basically remind you on that. Okay, so the sum of these parameters, of course, alpha zero is excluded. Okay, so that's not part here of the sum. But apart from that, okay, you have every single parameter in it. Okay, that's something we have seen. This is equivalent to the uh, basically the issue that one minus the sum of these parameters is going to be greater than zero. Nothing basically is special here. And then for the generalized version, okay, so you need to understand that if the process is stationary, then it's unconditional variance look like this. So you might see why, um, I mean, this is the condition, okay, that you see, or in particular, wait a moment, um, that one, okay, why is that the condition? This is basically the condition because otherwise the variance of the process would be negative okay so that would not work so you would not come this far if it was even if you could one because then the variance would not be finite okay you would not come this far but if basically it would be greater than one then this expression would be negative which is a contradiction so that would not work okay so if that is true then the variance look like this and if this is not true then the variance does not look like this so then it's going to be basically expressing you that the um that stationarity or for stationarity, it is equivalent, okay? It is equivalent 
for the sum of the parameters to be strictly less than one. You understand that, guys? So this is what we have seen last week. I just wanted to recall it, and for its generalized version, it's not similar. You simply just basically put the definition to it, and then you also make use of the fact that you know these are these things. Okay, so if you take the expectations of them, which is also equal to the expectation of its square, because the mean of the process is going to be zero, you'll find, and that's something that you need to understand here, is that you simply add these parameters to that, okay, so that the condition. So this must be less than one, if and only if the sum of these parameters, all of them, okay, except for alpha zero. So the only parameters that are not considered as alpha zero, but every other parameter is in part, part of the condition, the sum of these parameters with respect to these alphas and with respect to these betas is strictly less than one, which is equivalent that one minus the sum of these parameters is non-negative. Okay, now, and that is going to be the case, and this simply just puts these sums, additional ones, into the consideration for the variance. This is what it was, and that's, that's what we have seen last time. Yes, you got a question. Zero shouldn't be in there. Excuse me? It's not in there. It's not in there. It's not in there. So that parameter is not there. Okay, neither is it is part of the variance. I mean, in the denominator, it's part of basically the numerator. Okay. So it says one minus alpha zero minus one. No. Should be. Uh, there is not there. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's wrong. Sorry. Yeah, I need to fix that. Sorry, that was wrong. Sorry for that. I don't know why it did it, say. I, I so always I was excluded on that error right there. <laughs> Probably yes. I don't know why. Anyways, but thanks. Okay, I will fix that slide. Okay, guys, uh, I apologize. Now, yeah, so what is going to be looking like? Now, why is that? So we have seen the unconditional variance from last week. The unconditional variance of last week for the process just looked like this. So that was basically part of that. Okay. And for a stationary process, these variances must be identical because if they're not, then they, there is time dependency regarding the unconditional variance. Okay. So this must be equal to basically the variance at time point t. That is also equal to the variance at time point t. So is the last one, which is also equal to the variance of time point t, and that's it. Okay. All right, guys. So that is what basically what you'll have. And uh, the stationarity, I mean, again, so I, re I recall it. Okay. It requires two variances to be equal. So if these variances are equal, then you simply just put them, I mean, you, would, you could replace them, and then you would need to solve this, basically, this equation for the variance. And that yields the expression that you just saw. This is what we had last week, okay? And if you want to generalize this expression, I mean, you would do exactly the same steps at, that we did last week, which we not we would not need to do it now, so it's not going to be a requirement regarding it, okay? If you look at the generalized version, okay, you would simply just consider its definition first, okay? So there it is. There is a new definition here, basically, for the volatility process. And as a consequence, you will find these expressions added to it, okay? And that's relatively simple to see. Why? Because as you might be, as you might be guessing, this expression is equal to the, I mean, for example, that one is equal to the expectation of the unconditional variance at time point t minus one. As you might see, the expectation of the squares minus the square of the expectation is equal to the variance. Okay, so that's exactly the same. All right, and that, that, that would be basically generated from it. So again, these are going to be the variances. Okay, so that is the variance basically. Okay, if you take the expectation of that. So let me just basically remind you, so the expectation of this square is equal to the expectation of the square of the volatility process, so expectation of that. Okay, so because that's this is equal to the variance. Okay, so there therefore this expression, this one as well as this one, will have the same expectation. All right, that's just a consequence. So you need to basically to consider that fact here. Okay, and if you solve this new equation for the variance of the process you will find the expression similarly actually that you just saw for the arch type process. Okay, so 
all that comes is basically additional sum of these parameters. Okay, that's it. Nothing else, guys. Okay, that's basically what it was, and therefore, I'm not going to elaborate on that one, but that's not difficult, actually, to see, okay? Now, as far as the representation is considered, okay, so that's what we have seen when I was, you know, taking the, or using the interpretation of the arch process, what, what would that indicate, and that you could, something that you could test. I mean, by the way, you can also solve your assignment by basically just doing that one. So, I'm not focusing on, you can simply just take an AR process if you have already imp implemented that one because that's much, e much easier to estimate than an armor model. But if you find the packages for armor model of the squares, then you can use a generalized version, but you don't have to, okay? Now, if you define basically this process E by, you know, you would see, I mean, that's the issue. And you'll find that the unconditional expectation of this process would be equal to zero. So that resembles to a noise. I mean, that's not the precise equivalency here. Okay, so that's not a noise necessarily because there is not necessarily not a correlation, but you can also look at that way as well. Okay, so if you do the expectation, the expectation of a difference is a difference of the expectations and these things are equal. So that's going to be, as you see before, so that's going to be equal to zero. Okay, and uh, so therefore, you can basically consider that one as to be a, let's say, a semi-noise or something. Okay, if you substitute for the volatility process by this expression here, okay, I mean, of course, you would need to rearrange that, okay, but that's not difficult, so that's going to be epsilon t squared minus et, all right? So that's basically it, and then you will substitute it here then you can express basically the current observation of the squares as an autoregressive model where E is supposedly be the noise of the process. So that implies basically an autoregressive model of the squares and of order Q, of course, because that's the order of the I process. I mean, we have seen this before last week. Okay, so that's nothing new. Now, if you take the realization, okay, so again, arch implies an AR model of the squares, which is not difficult for, to see. So you can test this, okay, simply just taking the squares of the process, okay. For example, you take the asset returns and then you square them and try to estimate an AR model. And if this AR model is significant, let's say at the 5% level, then you could basically argue that the data shows some conditional heteroscedastic effects okay so you can also basically come to the conclusion because that's again so an arch model is relatively difficult to estimate but again i mean relatively speaking because for an R model you simply just use an r or less but keep in mind that's just testing the effects not establishing how the equation would look like because these are not going to be necessarily if you estimate these parameters these are not going to be the parameters not necessarily going to be in arch um, model. So you might get basically different results if you re try to re-estimate the process. Okay, but you would try to basically just establish whether it has some arch arch effects or not. Okay, so that's one way to do it. That's not the only way, by the way, but that, that's that's one way. Well, I would not do, use the fact. And then the generalized version. Now, as far as the generalized version is concerned, again, so you just need to consider the definition. And then if you use the same reparameterization, that's called reparameterization, by the way, you'll find that, I mean, as you see, this is what the process is by its definition. And if you rearrange that, okay, you have basically everything. So you have the dependency with respect to the past for the squares, as well as some sort of, you know, past version of the noises. So yeah, there is the past of that one as well as that one and so on, every other between. So there is the lag version of the noise, and if you put the lag version of the noise into the model, that generates a moving average part, and then this moving average part is added to the autoregressive part. So this implies basically that the generalized version would yield an ARMA model. Now, with basically, you need to understand that Q is the order of the autoregressive part, and P is the order of the moving average part. Okay, so don't confuse the two. Okay, of course, I mean, we, you can assume that, uh, I mean, this is not, this not goes beyond that, but that's something that you would 
necessarily do. Okay, so P would be basically the order of the moving average part. Okay, and then there is a reparameterization. So you would have basically the sum of two parameters yielding basically the uh, AR component of the squares. Okay, so for the first leg. And that's that's it. But that's just a reparameterization. So you don't need to take care of the fact that whether Q or P is greater. Okay, it doesn't really matter. Okay, but the order here is different. So P refers to basically the order of the generalized part where you would have the condition of variance included into, I mean, the path of the condition of variance into the, included into the process itself. And then Q is the order basically of the arch part, but that's it. Okay, so that is referring to the autoregressive part of the squares within the condition of variance process. Okay, okay, so don't, don't be confused by that, but that's basically the intuition. Now, again, in the armor model is actually an AR model for, or which, in, which is a relatively large AR model, let's say. Okay, so when you look at these reparameterizations, that was intuition, so why would you use an armor model instead, because one of the reasons is basically it has fewer parameters. So since it has fewer parameters, it might be more practical to estimate it. Okay, that's one of the reasons. I mean, we discussed that as well. Okay, so regarding these your parameterization. So if you if you have you find that the AR model, let's say you use the information criteria and you find that the AR model is relatively large that you would try to estimate, and you can use that on this explanation for your current work, okay? So whenever you try to establish an AR model of a certain order and you find that the order is relatively large, then by the end you could argue that you would basically rather consider estimating an armor model instead, but you don't need to, okay? So that's not any necessity because again, I told you before, it's much easier to estimate an AR model in general, okay? But there are packages that you could use if you like, but you don't need to. So you don't need to go be this far. Okay, but you could incorporate that part also if you like, but you don't need to. So I will not take that for granted because this is one day before you run out of time. So why would I be use that one? Anyways, guys. Okay, so that's the intuition. I hope it's, it's becoming clear. And uh, that's basically also the intuition for the, the generalized autoregressive conditional heteroscalar model. So these things relate to each other just as the way as AR and R models relate to each other. That's, these are the parallels, okay? And uh, again, since R models are, let's say, or I mean, not equivalent, but let's say, are from the practical perspective, just from the practical perspective, relatively large. AR models, okay, just as the way basically as arch processes. So if you find the order of the arch process to be relatively large, right? Okay, I mean, that, that can happen. So to capture basically the structure of the conditional variance of the process, which you would try to do because it's stochastic, right? If it's, if it's basically relatively large, then you would estimate the Garch model instead. And the most common model that people use is the Garch one model. So that's the easiest one and also the most common one. It captures a lot. So this is basically the model that people use most often, okay, or so the most common one. Let's have a little discussion about that one. So how would you basically consider that now? Okay, a alpha zero is strictly greater than zero and the others are simply just non-negative, okay? And what I do is basically I would substitute the conditional variance, okay? I mean, I would look at basically what the conditional variance at the current observation point would be, okay? So this is basically what it is. And then if you, basically do that one, so the current observation, I mean, the observation at time point t minus one, you would substitute for here, okay? If you put that together, and that's how we did that also for the AR process itself, you would have a different structure, okay? So that's where you would start, okay? So you take that, and you put that one, that expression here, and then you have a sum, and then you multiply basically every, every sum in here from it by beta one. So then you will have alpha zero times beta one plus alpha one times beta one times the square of the process plus beta one squared times the lag version basically here for that model. So you, okay, so I put those together. Okay, so these are, 
or that's what it's going to be okay and uh, yeah so I mean you just simply you know rearrange that stuff okay and I'm a, I was having that here if I did it correctly this is going to be the last one so as you might see this is you know these are the pros uh, these are the, the the processes between I use beta 1 to the power of 0 just to make sure because of course that's equal to 1 okay everybody sees that but just to make sure what the relationship would be okay so you have an increasing exponents here related to it so then you can simply just uh, capture it so if you look at basically the the this time lag okay so where you would substitute basically here okay and then you would restructure it the same way that I did okay and then you try to you know capture the generalized structure of the model okay which you can do or you would do that later on so then if you basically do that step again this is basically the second iteration this is how it's going to be so you have one plus beta one plus beta one squared plus and then you do would have beta one to the third beta one to the fourth and so also that's not difficult basically to basically to suggest how it would be after new iteration so you can use induction for that and then of course you have this expression here beta 1 to the power of 0, which is equal to 1, times alpha 1 times the square of the process at time point t minus 1, and then you have the some sort of similar structure for the square of the process at time point t minus 2. The only thing that basically this increases, okay, so the exponent here increases, and so the time lag would decrease. That's it, okay? And then you might be guessing that this is going to be beta 1 squared times alpha 1 times y t minus 3 to the second that's it okay so it's not difficult to guess after that all right which is exactly that so again and then if you could would continue so for the next iteration you would have basically beta 1 cubed and then you will have beta 1 cubed times sorry alpha 1 times y t minus the y t minus 4 to the second there you go so that would be basically using induction so you recognize what the structure would be and that's always the final one okay so then if you do it let's say two times you have this one okay and if you do it another time then you have beta one to the fourth times the conditional variance at time point t minus four and so on so you can use simply just induction to establish that and if you do this let's say infinitely many times okay Time is not bounded from below. Let's assume that one. I was discussing the structure of time, but I'm not going to do that again. Okay, that's what it's going to be. Okay, so here, this is what the final expression would look like. And uh, you simply can see that these things, okay, if, and let me say that, so if under a certain circumstance, because that's not only true, you where you would have basically the last expression. So there is, there is another one which I dismissed. This would be beta 1 to the power of plus infinity. And now that would be just the limit of that times, you know, the infinite lag or infinite time lag for the process. Now you could also, you mean, and you would all, you would assume that this is, let's say, you know, whatever, some, some type of a constant almost surely. So you can simply assume whatever that would be because it's random that you could simply assume it's going to be something which is, finite let's say almost surely almost surely means with probability one so if you assume that and if you assume in addition that these things would converge to zero then the death would disappear okay so actually it would be enough for that to basically to disappear as the basically you know the, the number of i mean n is basically the number of uh number of iterations okay so here you have n is equal to 1, that was the first, n is equal to 2, that was the second, second iteration, and so on. And you would do this infinitely many far. So in this case, this is what you will have. Okay, now, again, I also would assume, I was not perfect here, I would also assume that um, the condition of variance, okay, as basically, you know, time progresses, is going to be finite almost surely. So that's going to be finite, let's say, basically almost surely, all right, with probability one. But I didn't consider that one, okay, because since it's random, you know, if that's not true, then it might be some issues. But 
let's assume that it is would be true. Anyways, so I was skipping that. It was it's not clear from the mathematical. It's not nice. Let's say from a mathematical perspective. Anyway, so and if this is true, by the way, then also that sum converges. So I would I would skip that one, but that sum converges, of course, because that is a geometric series. Okay, if it's a known sequence, it does. Okay, because the only thing that would imply that this this would require for basically for its absolute value to be less than one. Otherwise, that would not be true. So that would not be a null sequence. Only if basically this is basic and uh, the absolute value of that is less than one. Okay, so that is only true if and only if its absolute value is less than one. So in that regard, that sequence is finite, and then you'll have the following limit. So in this case, the limit of that is simply just one by one minus beta one. Okay, so according to the geometric series. I mean, everybody, I think everybody has seen it before. Okay, so which I put over here. Okay, so if that is true, okay, but you cannot dismiss that one. Okay, so there is no way to, to skip that one. And uh, yeah, but it doesn't really matter. So if basically the absolute value of B, B is less than one. Now, the condition would be that basically that B, beta one is between negative one and one, but this parameter is not negative. So it's going to be basically between zero and one. Okay, it can be zero, by the way. But that's that's why it was it was adjusted. Okay, so again, keep in mind, guys, this parameter is not negative. Okay, so there is no way basically that the parameter would be basically somewhere between negative one and zero. Okay, so that's, that's not going to happen. All right, now. This is, as you see, and now let me go back a little bit. This is, okay, an AR model, okay, and uh, of order infinity for the squares, right? So, as I was basically illustrating that before, okay, this, 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 this implies a relatively large AR model for the squares. So, Garch implies that, and the large AR model for the squares is basically indicating an ARMA 1 1 model. So you would basically rather say, I mean, since we, we start from here, if the process follows the Garch 1 1 model, this implies an ARMA 1 1 model for the squares. Okay? Which you can say. So you would rather choose to estimate a model like this. You understand what, what I'm saying, guys? So this illustrates exactly the same issue that we discussed prior when it when it came to the, the intuition for introducing moving average parts or moving average components here for the noise which you also would consider basically as a generalization because these effects regarding the conditional variance can be relatively large when it comes to acid returns i'm kind of i'm basically kind of excited about what kind of ar models you would try to i mean basically you would try to establish okay when it comes to you know looking at arch and garch effects and uh yeah so that's um basically what i'm looking for so you can again you can use that fact okay so if you find basically the models to be relatively large that maybe your information criteria you would try to estimate then you could also you could go a step further and say okay we would um let's say either i mean you would say okay the squares would follow an armor model, which indicates basically the generalized version of the process. Okay, for when it comes to the arch effects. Yeah, so I hope basically that that fits to your purpose. And uh, again, so that's the most common one, I think. Maybe our Garch 1 2 or 2 1 process, but 80% of the time that's going to be it. Yes? In the instance of uh, when we have maybe not so many legs from the information criteria, uh, but the, the function of the information criteria is, is not increasing that much after, after the optimal point. Could this also be an indication of, of a gauge structure? Could be the case, again. And so the information criteria would definitely tell you what, you know, what type of model you would, uh, it would choose most of the time. So I haven't basically seen that anyways. Okay, I would not evaluate basically every single point, but usually when you implement these information criteria, I mean, I use packages that, that will take the display basically the, the, the model selection also.
Okay, so again, you don't need to um, estimate that, but if you find basically your, the, your AR model is relatively large, at least basically for the SWOTS criteria, and then you could basically automatically come to the conclusion that you would choose the generalized version instead, whatever the generalization would be. Okay, so, but again, it's also subjective. So I admit basically this is not, I mean, this, this is ambiguous in that regard. So how to approach that issue. But the, the fact of the matter is that um, there is no general way to do that. So it depends on how you justify it, basically. It's, it's relatively difficult, by the way. It's relatively difficult to justify your model selection. But uh, there is no necess necessary right or wrong in that, in that case. You know, I'm just basically looking for the justification. That must sound plausible in that sense. So that must be plausible. But uh, basically, you could have the issue that two different people with the same data will come to two different conclusions. It happens. Okay, because there is advantages and disadvantages for everything. Right? I mean, that's, but that's, uh, again, so if nobody knows what the true model is, there's always model risk involved, and I mentioned that before. Well, what would you do? What I'm going to do, okay? I'm not, I, I'm not able to basically to, to drag out my, the, the true model from my button, so huh, nobody will tell me what the, what the model would be, all right? But that's an issue, so. But again, now, if, I hope this is, more, I mean, I, I admit basically I didn't fully answer your question, but the question is what, what I'm going to do then, you know, how would you, how would you do that? So you need to play with that a little bit. And, uh, but keep in mind, guys, a good model is always a simple one. Okay. So it's not difficult basically to, to justify, let's say, a Garch one, one type of model in that regard, I last think. So, and people use that as the logical consequence most of the time, but it depends. Right. Okay. So, as uh, using Armor One One type of model. So, if the process is stationary, then and you would see. Okay. And then you can simply just, you know, calculate the expectation of that because the expectation of a sum is the sum of the expectations. So you simply have basically that as part of the expectation of the conditional variance. Okay. So, and that's that. So I would basically argue that this is going to be the case. Now, what happens here is basically if these, these things are equal, okay? So if you want to solve that, then you can simply just do the same thing because this is going to be equal to one by one minus beta one as well, okay? So that is not a surprise. And if you rearrange that stuff, so you will, because that sum converges, if this is true, and let's assume that it is true, so then you would have a convergence here. And then you have one minus one by one minus beta one also. So that would yield basically alpha zero times one by one minus beta one plus alpha one times one by one minus beta one for the variance. And then you solve it for the variance. Okay, so for the variance you're going to have and that's what you'll find there if you basically just do that to so continue and, and that, sorry, one, the variance times, you know, one minus one by alpha one, sorry, alpha one times one by beta one is going to be the right hand side of this equation, that part. Okay, so sorry, not this far, this far. And if you divide by one by one minus alpha beta one, because one minus alpha, okay, so if you basically extend this, this is going to be. 1 minus beta 1 time divided by 1 minus beta 1, of course. So you have the common denominator. So that's going to be 1 minus beta 1 minus alpha 1 in the numerator. Okay, so that's what you have uh, here. And then if you divide by that, you'll simply just, you know, cancel 1 minus beta 1. So you're going to have alpha 0 divided by one minus beta one minus alpha one, that's going to be the variance. Okay, so if you solve this, it's not difficult, but I was skipping that one. So this comes back to the stationarity condition regarding the variance, and uh, that is consistent with it. So this is what it was. All right, guys, yeah, and um, 
that's that's it. Okay, so if that this is basically the case, if the sum of the parameters is of course less than one. In addition, so you have that one, we have those, and we have that. Okay, so there is a lot of combination regarding these restrictions here for that as well. Okay. So yeah, if the process is stationary, of course. So that state that is basically both sufficient and necessary for stationarity of the process. Anyways, but that's just, you know, capturing the, con the unconditional variance of the process.